A while ago, I did a video about five dream species that, you know, under perfect circumstances, if I had all the money in the world, you know, nothing illegal, but, you know, dream species out there of ones that I would really hopefully be able to get. But as everyone knows, no one has just five dream species. So today I want to talk about a few more, and actually it's going to be six dream species that I will hopefully have the real possibility of getting, maybe not this year or next, but in the hopefully near to distant future. And I'm just wanna go through some honestly really cool animals that I think are amazing that I just wanna share and talk about. So to start things off with, one of if not the rarest snake in the hobby today, and that is the rough scale python. So as with a lot of snakes that we have here in the hobby, we gotta to look to Australia. So in Australia, in the far northwestern part of the island continent, whatever you wanna call it, in the Kimberley region, which for some of you reptile aficionados should know kind of where that is, basically they have the smallest range or one of the smallest ranges of any known snake species. It's this tiny little area in the Kimberley region of northwestern Australia that's kind of in between two different little rivers and in between some mountains and this like a couple little valleys where not a whole lot is known about them. They were basically rediscovered very recently and they're a really cool looking snake. They're basically like if you took a green tree python, gave it the scales of a bull snake and then gave it the attitude, personality and temperament of like a Bredel's python. But so we're talking, you know, a five to six foot long snake with keeled scales that holds on to humidity, retains that humidity in there, and then has more of like a kind of chiller carpet attitude with bright blue turquoise eyes. They are so pretty. One of the very few animals on this list that, actually there are a couple that I've gotten in touch at this point, but some of the animals that I've very infrequently gotten the ability to actually handle, which just makes me want it more. Such a beautiful, beautiful animal. They're so cool. Not a whole lot is known about them other than the kind of area where they're from. Um, they've been associated with like fruit trees. They have been found up in the canopies of those trees, maybe like preying on animals that come by. And if they're not hanging out there, they're kind of on like soundstone outcroppings of the rocks of the valleys that they live in. They're still very rare, but a few of them have come from, I think, I believe European lines because more stuff was exported out to Europe than ever got to here, um, exported. Uh, and we are starting to get them more frequently in the hobby. They breed very successfully. Their keeping and husbandry is not terribly difficult or complex. So they're getting more popular. There are more animals and they're starting to pop up here and there. And one of my favorite Pituophis breeders actually keeps rough scales as well. So maybe one day I'll be hitting them up for uh, some really cool pine snakes and Baja gophers and maybe a couple rough scales as well. This one is one that I haven't personally been able to handle, but I've met a few private keepers that do keep them as well as I've seen them in several zoos. And that is the Dominican mountain red boa or the Dominican red mountain boa. I've seen them both ways, so please don't yell at me in the comments about that. Basically on the island of Hispaniola, it's divided into two countries with Haiti on, one, on the eastern side and the Dominican Republic on the western side. And on there, there are three subspecies of a species of boa that are divided between the Haitian boa, the Dominican boa, and the other one that I am totally brain farting on right now. And I apologize, we don't really work with it too much in the hobby. So I'll try to remember to put it right here. But on the Western side, on the one very small part of it, that's the Dominican red mountain boa. A beautiful, beautiful animal that is a very moderate, good sized snake, you know, five to six feet -ish long. They can get a little bit longer, I believe upwards of eight feet would be a very large one. They are very well known for that bright red coloration, although there is quite a variety of individualum in them in their natural range. There's a big wide variety of like a dark gray to black scale of rusty oranges and browns and even a little bit of yellow. Um, and similar to other animals, a very good example would be crested geckos. They are actually able to hormonally shift and fire up, fire up their color to do from one. So it could be kind of a dark brown and fire up to a bright orange. It's a very, very cool animal. And while I'm not gonna pretend that my favorite is not that bright red color, it is really amazing and cool to see such a diversity of the individual of animals in such a small range of an area. They normally look very similar in small pocket of populations and they'll diversify as populations grow out geographically. It's such a really cool snake. They typically have 
it's it's kind of well known that of almost I hate the blanket statements, but they're basically a very well tempered, chill, semi arboreal animal that handles very well and is very tolerant. They don't get very large, but they do like to climb. So essentially kind of what I want to do in some of my cages, at least in this building, is I want to have larger, taller, custom PVC enclosures to put some of these, and I'm going to talk about all of the ones today, in those enclosures to do very well. They're an amazing species, and our good buddies up in Anchorage at the Reptile Barn actually have a pair of them who have been teasing them almost as long as my doom rolls have been teasing me about uh, having a litter of those. So hopefully one day they do produce some and I'll be getting some of them from them as well. I have talked about the Timor Python in at least two other videos and that is saying something because I try to diversify and not repeat too much of the different snake species to try to always keep it changing. So both I'm learning new things into research as well as I'm presenting new stuff for all of you to watch and learn about as well. But I love the Timor Python. So these guys are actually found down in the Sunda Islands in parts of Indonesia. I did incorrectly state in the first video I talked about them that they are found on the island of Timor. There's actually several islands that make up the Sunda Island archipelago. They're not actually found on Timor. They're found on several other ones. Um, they are a moderate sized species. They're part of the genus Malaya Python, which has had several other people come in and out of that genus, including Bolin's pythons, Bismarck pythons, and uh, reticulated pythons. And honestly, Timor's kind of look like a shrunken down, really cool patterned reticulated python, but they don't necessarily act like that. They're supposedly a little bit more feisty and flighty compared to a lot of other python species, but they're so pretty. I just love the pattern. There's no real morphs or pattern aberrations or anything like that. It's just kind of a really aberrant, modeled, varied, really cool pattern that they have of their dorsal scales. And it has that really distinct cutoff between their belly and their dorsal scales. They're just so beautiful. They are, like a lot of the ones that I'm going to talk about today, uh, fairly arboreal. They spend basically like half and half of their time on the ground and in trees. So again, some a nice little custom habitat where you're able to have a bunch of really good climbing and, and uh, perching branches, a nice UVA, UVB light, a big, nice wide open area for them to go to the ground if they so choose. It'd be amazing to get a pair of those to work with. More this one might actually surprise some people considering how much I favor uh, a lot of the old world rat snakes and boas and pythons. But this one is arguably the most beautiful and striking non-venomous snake on the planet asterisk and that is the california red-sided garter snake and the reason why i say asterisk is because it is very closely related to the san francisco red-sided california garter snake and basically there is a little bit of difference between both the locality the individual subspecies as well as the san francisco's are usually just a little bit brighter and more colorful and consistent this these animals are bright red and blue with black blotching and checkers. They look incredible. They are a garter snake, but they actually get a little bit larger than a lot of the ones that we usually see in the hobby, like the plains, the wanderings, and the checkers. They can actually get upwards of 50 inches or more. Beautiful, beautiful snake. However, the San Francisco garter snake is actually very endangered. It's up there with the endangered species in North America, like the Eastern Indigo, the Black Pine Snake, and the Louisiana Pine Snake. So if you ever wanted to work with a San Francisco, number one, their populations are not nearly as prevalent in captivity as some of the other ones I just mentioned, but you again need special permits and things like that. And I believe because California has even other rules that I am unaware of, it's probably even more difficult to work with the San Francisco's. However, the California Red Sided Garter Snake, which there is a little bit more variation of, is not in danger, but it is heavily sought after because of how beautiful it is. And they don't have as large of litters because they are ovovivarious, which means that garter snakes as a whole, I believe there's one or two that are not, um, but they develop eggs inside of them, the eggs hatch, and then the babies come out. They don't have as large of litter clutches, I don't know exactly the real terminology for that, as some of the other ones. So they don't have as many babies, they are highly sought after and they're very expensive. So out of this whole list, it will probably be the one that I get the last, unless again, 
someone that I know really closely is like, okay, we're going to get you this tri-stripe ball python, this Dominican mountain boa, this one, this one, this one. I go, okay, here's my money for the year. Back on track for the species that are semi-arboreal, this is one that I've talked about again in another video, but I absolutely, I, I must get a hold of these guys. These are the Madagascar or Malagasy tree boas, or Senzenia is the genus. You've probably, if any of you guys have started to divulge a little bit into the different types of reptiles, you may have heard of that genus or type of snake before, that Senzenia snake. So these guys are found essentially the way a lot of Madagascar species of the different ones are kind of split up to where there's Easterns and Westerns of the Senzenia, two different subspecies, just like in Dumeril's boas. There's Dumeril boas and then Malagasy ground boas. A little bit different, different, those two are different species, but the Senzenia are different subspecies. These guys are really, really cool. Their behavior and their habitats are fairly similar, where these guys are actually really heavy. They're kind of a weird looking tree boa. They're really heavy body for an arboreal snake. They're much, much more thicker, more stoutly built. They don't get terribly long, maxing out around six feet. So a lot of that, that arboreal snake length, that's that four to six feet, because they just kind of curl up pretty well. Although they don't make that perfect like little clutch and perch that like GTPs and Amazon and Emerald tree boas make. Um, then they have a really kind of blocky stout head. It looks almost like you took an Amazon tree bow and a Doomrolls bow and they made a love baby and it looks absolutely amazing. Um, and also similar to, similarly to a lot of other snakes, they go through an autogenic change, which means when they hatch or when they're born, because they're a boa, live birth, they look away and then as they get older, their outward appearance or their color changes so with green tree pythons, they're born yellow red, and then they grow to that bright green color. These guys are born a really reddish, ruddy orange color, and then they slowly change up to their adult forms with the Easterns being this kind of bright green, black and white, and then the Westerns being a tannish brown, white and black, both with striking, almost like diamond patterns along them. They look so cool. And again, they are a weird animal. Again, like I said, super thick bodied, weird head for a tree boa. Still really big teeth like most arboreal snakes. But these guys in Madagascar have frequently been found at night on the ground hunting, going through the leaf litter, looking for things. And then during the day, they're actually up in the trees and perched up in the trees away from ground predators, probably like Dumeril's boas and other animals that are cruising around on the ground for other animals. So they're hiding up the trees during the day, which is the tree boa, which is probably where they were originally found. And then at night is actually where they're doing a good majority of their hunting, probably. So again, one of my picture perfect ones, almost similar to like my carpet python cage uh, that Juliet has as I go over here as the camera's stuck, sorry about that, where it's almost like a square where there's a good amount of floor space plus plenty of room to perch and to climb around on branches. I don't know which of the two species that I, of the two subspecies, the Easterns or the Westerns, I don't know, honestly know which I like. Like there's nothing like a, a green snake, especially like a larger green snake that's really cool, but the patterns of the Westerns are just so beautiful. I really don't know which one I want. And I know I don't have the space to get a pair of both. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, I have a real profinity to boas and pythons as well as Asian rat snakes. Now I already have what I think might be my favorite Asian rat snake and that's the rhino rat, but there is a very close runner up and that is the hundred flower rat snake or otherwise known as the Mullendorf's rat snake. These guys are beautiful. So these hoes are found in parts of China into Northern Vietnam. They live in mountainous topography. Again, if we think of the mountains of China, so like the low rolling foggy mountains with nice thick, uh, with cooler temps and, and thick vegetation, sometimes non-deciduous vegetation. It's really cool. I get that very distinct picture in your mind. Like think Kung Fu Panda almost. Uh, and then this snake is amazing. So basically this is a very large Asian rat snake where the coloration of it looks the pattern is very similar to like a corn snake where it's that kind of model pattern and checkered underbelly. But instead of being that four to f like four to five foot long corn snake, it's sometimes upwards of eight plus feet, bright green and silver colored. And then with a ruddy red, sometimes to bright red head and tail with red eyes. They look beautiful. And then that hundred flower is essentially what they get from that bright green 
stem of the body to that bright red and the coloration looks like 100 flowers blooming, right? Oops, sorry, hitting stuff. But this is such a cool snake. They're really rare in the hobby because similar to the Mandarin rat snakes, for a long time, we would get them out of like food markets out of China and Vietnam where they wouldn't be kept very well and they had a very low survivability rate. And these guys suffered a very similar bleak outlook. But some people in the United States as well as in Europe and other places have started to breed them with a little bit more frequency and they're starting to pop up a little bit more often. So a captive bred animal, just like the mandarin rat snake, is almost like a corn snake with a little bit different husbandry needs. The Mullendorf rat snakes are getting closer to almost like a beauty snake of needs, although not nearly as feisty as like the Taiwanese beauties or the Vietnamese blue beauties. As adults, they do need very large enclosures, probably like six feet by three feet at minimum, because they are fairly arboreal. They're very long and thin body. They're not really like a really thick, heavy snake like a boa. They're really thin and long, almost like almost like the yellow-tailed Kribos, where they're still gonna have a decent body size, but because they're so long, they're a little bit more thin and strung out. They will be found on the ground and under rocks and in caves and crevices, but they are fairly active during the day, so they make a really cool display species. So you can have this very large, impressive setup, maybe bioactive, heavily planted, and you can just have like a really cool fogger. Again, you need to keep them at cooler temps. They overheat very easily, like a lot of the Asian species. They could just look amazing. And that is something I really wanna do. Like I said, I have this big building that I have some of the more uh, warmer weather ones, and then the geckos and the Asian rats are in a different building that one of these days I will have like my Brazilian rainbow boas, they'll be there, that's where they are now. They'll be there in much larger enclosures, and then I'll have my Asian rat snakes, and I'll have like on one wall, the Mullendorf rat snake with like the little geckos probably around that. So I'm gonna have to change up the whole thing one of these days. So anyway, just amazing, amazing, cool species. And then obviously, as I've said before, I don't know how many times, huge snake guys. So that's why all of these are snake ones. And it's not to say that I don't absolutely want some other lizard species. You've heard me talk about getting a Merton's monitor. I don't know how many times at this point, but I just wanted to share with you some really cool species of snakes that I absolutely have a passion for. I can't wait to get a hold of, and I just wanted to share some of those with you guys. Maybe you've heard of them. Maybe, you, heck, maybe you even work with some of them. You would say, hey, Jay-Z, I have a clutch coming this year. Do you want to get your name on a list? Give me that money. And I'll say, I'll, I'll do my best. This is, oh my goodness. But hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. Hope everyone's having a great day. Questions, comments, concerns, ideas for future videos, as always, down in the comments. You can email me, Facebook, Instagram, all of that uh, social media mumbo jumbo. Hope everyone's having a great day, and we'll check you next time.